name is Lauren Mill. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, I am the lead data scientist for the High Streets Data Service at the Greater London Authority, and today I'm talking about adaptive reuse of data for adaptive reuse of high streets. So we'll go into a little bit of detail on that in a second. Um, let me just make sure I can do this properly. Um, basically, what the High Streets Data Service does is we're looking to revitalize high streets given like the modern context in which they are surviving, um, and I'm going to go into details about how we did that and how we've built this program over the last few years. So, introduction, where did we come from? Um, basically, oh, my notes are not moving at all. Okay, we're just gonna go live then. That doesn't seem to be moving. The main one is, oh, it's quite slow, it's fine. Um, I'll wing it, because we know the program very well and we've been working on it for quite a while. Um, so, London, for those of you who are not from the city, um, it's quite an old city, which most people probably know this. Um, and it's sort of a, it's an aggregation of a bunch of little towns. And all these little towns had their own sort of markets and, and town centers. And each one of these town centers and high streets is what we mean when we talk about the London High Street. Each have sort of their own flavor, um, their own culture, their own sort of retail offering. And they've all aggregated into the city now that we know today. And there's about 600 of them. 90% um, of Londoners live within 10 minutes walk of their local high street. Um, they provide about 1.5 million jobs, and if you live in London, you probably have a relationship with your local high street. Maybe your local pub's there, or it's that restaurant that you really love, or it's just where you get your groceries at like 10.30 at night because you've got to the local shop. Um, so that's the context in which we're sort of operating. Um, you may have heard a narrative that the British high street is on the decline, um, or that it's dying. Um, it's true that there are headwinds uh, facing them, uh, businesses are sort of grappling with the fact that a lot of stuff has moved onto the e-commerce space. Um, there's been a generational shift. A lot of people don't want to do the casual shop anymore. And then, of course, there's a cost of living crisis. Um, people have less disposable income, and so are they not going um, to their high street? They're trying to save money where they can, and a lot of that is online. Um, so at the GLA, the mission has always been to support high streets via what we call adaptive strategies. And this means thinking about how we can adapt the existing built environment of the high street um, to support community in novel ways and also address a lot of um, specific environmental, um, social, and economic challenges that each high street is facing. Um, of course, COVID accelerated a lot of this, um, basically instant lack of footfall in a very short period of time. Um, it really exacerbated a lot of the sort of perpetual problems that the high streets um, were facing. So that's a little bit of background. Um, so we've got the background context of needing to sort of adapt high streets for a modern usage context and the added pressure of COVID-19. Um, we basically had London leaders needing to figure out um, what to do, how to approach um, sort of the saving of the high streets and making them sort of perpetually available to Londoners into the future. There are sort of three, um, three problems that London authorities face. And right, so again, for those of you who don't live in London, there's an added complication here that London has, is, doesn't actually just run by the GLA, there's 33 different councils that each run their own individual high streets. So there's a lot of different people, a lot of different decision makers going into sort of finding solutions for the high streets. So there's three problems that we, that we have. We've got the evidence problem. Decisions are made from anecdotal, outdated, or inaccurate knowledge. We have a coordination problem. Um, data sets are hard to find. And again, because of these like 33 local authorities, um, it's really hard to find like a common research framework to what does unify the high streets across boroughs and what doesn't. And then finally, the, the great challenge of cost. And so anyone working in public sector knows that that is always sort of the major challenge is how are we gonna finance this? Because a lot of the public, uh, the private data that um, is available is quite expensive. So what did we do? Um, we knew that any data service needed to be centralized and responsive and able to sort of pull the different levers to address all the different challenges across all these different stakeholders and decision makers across London. Um, so our response didn't happen overnight. If I have one thing that you remember from this is that this did not happen overnight. Um, we rolled out sort of a discovery phase of the project in 2020, which was consultant led via the mayor's recovery mission for COVID. Um, following that, we had an alpha phase that basically um, comprised strategic reports to really leverage the data that we did manage to get in those early days um, to start sort of um, saying some interesting things about how London was coming out of um, COVID and recovery. Our beta phase started in 2021. We had a pilot service with about 20 London boroughs and one dedicated analyst. 
And then finally, the live service started in 2022, and this is a full-time team. We've got 35 member organizations um, and about 300 users now working with our data sets. So we really have grown. It's been a slow process. It's been a bumpy road. This is probably not surprising to anyone that's tried to design these types of services. Um, but as a data service, obviously, you're probably wondering what kind of data we have. We have different streams and different scales. Um, the, the key thing that we wanted to do here is we wanted to make sure we had something that was pan-London, but also that was specific enough to address every single stakeholder as much as possible. Because even high streets in the same borough really differ in flavor and, and cultural context and that sort of thing. So we're sort of, that's the balance that we're trying to deal with these two different scales. Um, so the data that we offer in the service um, occupies a few different realms, but namely it's demography data. Um, we've got football data. Um, oh, I have a laser here. Um, which is sort of aggregate footfall data from mobile phone companies um, all across London on a grid. We also have the same thing for spend um, on a similar grid. We also have survey data that gives you a sense of like what businesses are on the high street, how many vacant storefronts there are. And then we have um, sort of environmental and transport data like air quality, transport linkages, that sort of thing. So that gives you a quick overview of the types of data that we're managing for the high streets data service. So the key question, obviously, was we have all this data, or we would have all this data, I'm speaking both in present and past. Um, how do we get this data into the hands of the local decision makers? And that's the really, really key thing here. And I think this is a challenge that a lot of people might face with data services, is you've got a lot of good data, but it can kind of languish in places it's not meant to be. It's meant to be with decision makers. And that's what we're really trying to strive to do here. Um, so here, I'm going to illustrate what we're calling the data value chain. Um, and I gave it away. Um, probably a lot of you in the room have done projects where you do this entire chain yourself. You go on and you collect the data. There's a whole bunch of middle things, which might differ based on the context of your, of your research. And then you end up with like an action at the end. It's a lot of work to do projects like this. And it's really not sustainable, especially given sort of the, the finite resources in public sector. So what we try to do here is operate sort of in this middle section and really manage a lot of the chain ourselves in a way that sort of coalesces that service for our end users. So we have data suppliers that are collecting and anonymizing the data anyway, and we have our data subscribers who basically can analyze and act on the data that we manage, curate, procure, um, and quality assure um, in the middle here. So this is where the adaptive bit comes in. We're adapting private data sources here that already exist to further our public mission of adapting high streets for future resilience. So that is basically the underlining um, key of what we're trying to do in the service. So strategically, the design allows suppliers to avoid the cost of marketing to lots of different organizations. They can talk with us, um, and we do a lot of that negotiation. It allows us to unify the data framework um, and apply data science and QA um, to make sure that the data actually are quality. Um, and this is a resource that we find that lots of councils don't have. Um, and finally, it allows councils to do the really important stuff, actually like embedding themselves in the data and finding the solutions that they need um, to suit their local context. So it frees up time for them to do the important stuff. So I've just described a chain, but really I like to think of this more as a hub um, where we sort of operate in the center here. Um, our suppliers, because we maintain relationships with them, we can negotiate with them constantly. And this really frees up um, an ability to create custom data streams. And so what I mean by custom data streams is that oftentimes if you're looking at repositories and you're, or you're working with a big company, sort of what you see or what you buy is what you get. Um, because of our supplier relationships, we can really customize the type of data that we can get from them based on user input that we get from our, um, from our subscribers. Um, the other benefit here is it's active stewardship. So it's never really a data dump where you're just finding something in a repo somewhere. Um, you don't really know who owns the data. You didn't know when it was collected. We really maintain these active relationships with our suppliers to make sure that the data are, are of quality. And when they're not quality, we can ask them to do a better job, which is also important as well. On our subscriber side, um, we really facilitate a particip participatory audience. And that, again, is to make sure that we can do these custom data streams to make sure that the data that we're buying from companies actually makes sense for the context that people need it. So we really want to encourage people to engage. We have multiple feedback channels to do that and flexible engagement, because lots of councils have there's varying degrees in which people have the time and effort to engage, and we want to make sure that we try and meet people where they are. So who exactly are all of these stakeholders? Um, 
a lot of them vary in terms of the time and effort that they um, can give to the service. So in terms of the membership, we've got our suppliers and our subscribers. Our suppliers currently are, um, are four. We have Experian that's offering up the um, survey data for business premises data. We're getting maps and things from Ordnance Survey. We are getting footfall data from BT's Active Intelligence. And we're getting spend data from MasterCard Data and Services. So they feed the data to us, and then we process and do a lot of sort of the back end pre-processing to make sure that it's, um, it's any good. And then we curate this and, and send it on to our um, subscribers. In terms of our subscribers, the point here is not to read every single person on here. The point is to illustrate how many people we have involved in the service. Um, and the key takeaway here is that everyone in here, we've got London boroughs, we've got business improvement districts, and we also have strategic partners um, and also academic research partners as well to do sort of more key investigative exploratory projects. The key here is that everyone in these organizations differs on these sort of two axes. We've got um, data and technical skills. People are either high or low confident. And we have people with decision-making power. They either have a lot of power or not a lot of power. So we really need to unify all these various people across, um, across channels to make sure that the data and the insights are working for them. So what's our offer in order to be able to do this? We structure it as follows. So strong data foundations at the bottom. I'm a data scientist. I really love the bottom. I like live in the bottom of this pyramid. Um, we're designing schema, we're pre-processing data, we're doing quality control, R&D, um, all these things that really make data repositories sing and data sets sing. So all of you data analysts in the room, I know that you are living down here um, doing these sorts of um, often thankless tasks to make sure that data are, are working properly. On top of that foundation, we offer reliable tools like self-service dashboards and interactive tools that users can then use themselves to get the data that they need. On top of that, we've got sort of a responsive consulting and analysis layer. This is where we do sort of custom reports and bespoke projects with people, sort of traditional consulting. Um, and we also do loads of training um, and workshops to make sure people are comfortable using the data themselves. And we run a help desk as well. Rachel's here in the audience running our help desk single-handedly. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, and then sort of spearheading this entire service is our strategic partnerships. And this lets us do sort of bespoke things with um, sort of pan-London decision makers um, exploring things like climate change or, or big transport links, sorts of things that um, sort of live outside of the high street, but that put us in the room with important people um, who are asking similar and related questions about how to keep London alive and keep it healthy. So to stay relevant, we've got sort of got two tiers or two categories. Um, we just we go places and we boost our profile as much as we can, which is something that probably resonates with lots of you. Um, here we are presenting our data at London Data Week last year, um, putting ourselves in the room again with key decision makers um, and London data bodies, just being in the room and making those conversations we find has been really, really important to sort of boosting our profile. But the thing that I care most about is this photo of our incubator program. We do lots and lots of training to make sure that our users feel confident with the data. Because it doesn't matter how good of a data service you have, if nobody's actually using it, um, you've sort of failed, you failed at the first hurdle. So we really want to make sure that people feel comfortable um, using the data themselves, knowing how to design a project, knowing how to use um, the scientific method, that sort of thing. So from this training and from the, like, boosting our profile, we've got some really great impactful data that's come, or um, studies that have come from the data. Um, I've just illustrated three. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to go very quickly. I don't know how much time I've got left. Um, the first thing here is we are Waterloo Business Improvement District and Lambeth Council work together to model the return of the Saturday market, which closed during COVID. Um, and they basically put forward um, a pitch to Lambeth Council saying that the Saturday market should return. Um, and that was a great project. I really, really loved working with the person I did um, in UR Waterloo. Um, we're working with the Nighttime Enterprise Zone program. They used um, high streets data service data to um, evidence that they could increase footfall in the evenings to lots of high streets, which encouraged businesses to keep their doors open longer, start night markets, and, and do structural um, build changes to high streets, um, like change lighting schemes and that sort of thing. And then finally, our ongoing work with the Friday effect, which is this effect of um, London workers not going into central London on a Friday, sort of this, this missing worker contingent um, 
has encouraged the mayor of London and transport for London to um, do an off-peak Friday fares trial, which actually just finished. And so we're going to work with them to see if that um, off-peak fair Friday trial worked to encourage people back into the office or back into central London during the week. So as a template for others, I'm going to hustle here because this is the thing I, I think is most data-driven myself, but maybe not. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of introspection of the service um, and do this in like a data-driven way, or at least in a data viz style way, of identifying what our features are, the audience that they reach, and the digital architecture that they require. So we have audience here on the x-axis, either specific audiences or general audience, and then we have digital architecture, nimble architecture or structured on the y-axis. Um, and so we sort of have four quadrants here, and I think it has really helped me understand our, our program very well by, by splitting things up. So we've got deployable, flexible, adaptable, and durable. So our deployable stuff is stuff that is for a specific audience that is highly structured. So it's stuff like our data dashboards and browser-based products that um, are sort of always available but allow people to come and um, investigate their own specific contexts. So that's what I mean by deployable. Um, the next is flexible. How can we stay on our toes, ready for change? This is all of our like lo-fi stuff, um, bespoke projects, working one-on-one -on -one with stakeholders, um, our help desk, all these sorts of things that don't really require a lot of digital architecture, um, but do allow us to meet our users um, where they are. The next is adaptable. So this is where our sort of events programming lives. Uh, we run loads of user workshops and training programs, again, to make sure that people are feeling confident with the data. They're often a general audience, and we have to adapt on the fly on the day to determine sort of what modules we're going to take in and out of the service or um, on the agenda to make sure that um, what we're offering actually appeals to people and actually meets them. And then finally, durable. And you might be thinking, why would you want durable? That's like cumbersome, and why would you want something that's structured architecture for a general audience? But what I find here is that this is the stuff that we're most well known for because it's the most persistent on online. Um, this is where our data repository lives. This is where all our documentation is. If people want to point someone else to the service, this is what people are going to find. And so putting time into making these things durable and persistent um, and high quality really, really helps um, people start there and then investigate the rest of these rest of the options. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the point is that nothing actually stays in one spot. Um, so for instance, our training programs, have encouraged our end users to lead a lot of research themselves, so that decentralizes a lot of our offer and allows things to be more nimble and specific to their need. Um, our data dashboards, we often find that people struggle with some of the ins and outs of how the tools work, and so we make sure that we add um, our data surgeries or office hours to make sure that people get that one-on-one -on -one help that they need. So what we've learned are lessons for longevity. Um, again, these probably resonate with many of you in the room. We find we want to stay as agile as possible. Um, having like a, a tiered release and response over many years helped us do a few things at a time. So if you can afford yourself the time to do things slowly, do. We find that's been really helpful. There's a great phrase from sociocracy, good enough for now, safe enough to try. So it doesn't have to be the perfect solution. Just try to get something on the table that works for people. They will tell you if it doesn't work. Um, Create a true end-to-end -end service. Really consider the user journey. So going back to this um, data value chain, what do people actually need? And really think about that journey all the way through from start to finish and figure out the off-ramping as well. What are you not going to try and do with your service? Work at different scales. That's the 2D plot I just showed. Um, can you meet the needs of various like audience members based on their skill and their decision-making power using lots of different tools and approaches? And then finally, Find those strategic partners. It really helps to be in the room with important people that um, have resources and time, and it's really given the data service an ability to live sort of outside its key offer, which is making sure London councils can um, revive their high streets and keep them healthy, but also lets us do a lot of cool strategic stuff as well, um, and that's really helped. And key, know your users. Again, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. You, we find we really need to regularly connect with them on what they actually need. As a data scientist, I think there's a tendency to um, over-engineer something maybe very beautiful and perfectly working, but if that's not what people need, you've just created a beautiful thing. So um, really, really also like check in with them constantly. I can't overemphasize that enough. Um, 
and also prepare because they'll change their minds frequently and they always, always do. Um, and we love them for that because it really keeps us nimble, it really keeps us responsive and it really makes sure that the high street sewer service can carry on into the years um, following so really into the future years beyond. So with that, I thank you. If you want to connect with us, here we are. Um, thank you, Alex.